Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a very humbling experience for me to be here uh, to see so many uh, friends, experts, and uh, people who care about Turkish-Armenian reconciliation in the room. And uh, with full disclosure, I will just start by saying that I'm a board member of Hasna. So, uh, and because I'm a, uh, a board member who often misses the board meetings, I guess this is my punishment, uh, by, uh, essentially, because of uh, the polarizing dimension of this for US domestic politics, for Turkish-American relations, and it's very difficult to avoid uh, the whole debate about what happened in 1915. Uh, but my own take on this issue is that we came to a point in Turkish-Armenian relations because of the failure of the protocols, and here I will assume that most of you are familiar already with uh, the history of uh, the last uh, two and a half years and the failure of the protocol process. We are at a point where uh, uh, there's a lot of pessimism uh, in Turkey and in Armenia uh, among people who want to see progress and reconciliation and government-to-government uh, -government relations are uh, not going anywhere and we are at a point where the best hope we have in terms of creating some momentum on this issue is uh, civil society dialogue, people-to-people -people dialogue. So uh, in that sense, whatever we call it, track two, track one and a half, civil society to civil society, NGO, people to people, uh, there may be an element of idealism in all this. And I, I, I can sense that people in government in Turkey, people in government in the US, in Armenia, who claim that they are realists, look at these issues and say, well, they're trying, uh, and uh, it's a uh, basically long-term effort, and they may to a certain degree think that uh, such projects, such efforts uh, may not get anywhere, and in a way there's, they may even think that there's a certain naivete in pushing for uh, this kind of projects, people-to-people -people projects, but I would argue that at this point the only realistic hope we have of uh, creating momentum is people-to-people -people projects. And uh, unfortunately, the point we're starting is very low. The, uh, the difficulty of people-to-people -people between Turkey and Armenia is that Turks don't know anything about Armenia. And Armenians don't know much about Turkey. I will tell you an anecdote of a good friend of mine who uh, uh, was with Rant, uh, Rant Dink, uh, in uh, 2005 uh, at a conference, and this conference was attended by uh, Armenians coming from Yerevan, uh, Armenian analysts, Armenian academics, think tankers, and Turkish think tankers, and the Turkish press was there uh, covering the event, and they were taking pictures uh, of Armenians coming from Armenia, and they were basically uh, very enthusiastically taking these pictures and uh, trying to get a sense of what Armenians look like uh, because they were Armenians from Armenia. And uh, there are 60,000 Armenian ethnic people in Istanbul with, who are Turkish citizens and Hrant think he was one of them. And this friend of mine turned to Hrant and said, what is the big excitement about taking pictures of Armenians? Why do you think the Turkish press is so uh, curious about uh, the, the, these people and uh, Rant uh, basically said well you know uh, we are Armenians too I'm an Armenian but we are so-called Armenians they are real Armenians <laughs> if you are familiar with the terminology of the official them in Turkey uh, so-called was always used for uh, the genocide issues the so-called genocide of 1915 so Rant in his very uh, uh, intelligent, uh, sarcastic way, said we are so-called Armenians here, we're not real Armenians, they are real Armenians. And uh, this anecdote in a way tells us that there is a need for real Armenians to come to Turkey and to see basically Turkey and there's a need for real Turks to go to Armenia. I myself had the opportunity to go to Armenia in 2005 and managed to uh, talk to uh, some university students, think tanks, and uh, uh, and I was frankly uh, uh, 
quite disappointed with the reaction I got from uh, young Armenians. Uh, I started my talks often by saying that there is in Turkey progress towards coming to terms with history. There is a new debate about the Ottoman Empire. There is now historians who are questioning uh, what happened in 1915. And uh, I, I, as a uh, uh, liberal democrat Turkish intellectual, was trying to uh, give them a, an empathetic view, a kind of uh, uh, moderate view of the debate in Turkey. And for what it's, it was worth, I told them that there is also this campaign in Turkey that is gaining momentum about uh, civil society activists who are uh, on the internet organizing, mobilizing for what came to be known later in, a, in, a, in one year, the I apologize, Özür Dilyor campaign. And to give you an idea about numbers, at the end of the day, 35,000 people signed up on this internet campaign, on, pit, on this petition, which was basically a petition by Turkish intellectuals saying that they apologize for what happened in 1915. And the term they used was not genocide, but was uh, basically uh, the tragedy, uh, the uh, great catastrophe, and uh, what I think the Armenian term uh, is uh, uh, and uh, so in a, in a sense, this was an attempt to relate to Armenia and to the Armenian term used for this. But uh, it showed that there is a growing critical mass. But the reaction I got from uh, uh, my Armenian friends in Armenia, uh, from, mostly from young people, which uh, was quite disappointing for me, was that an apology would not be enough. That an apology is very simple but that Turkey should come to terms with what happened truly and think about compensation. Think about financial compensation, territorial compensation. And one of them even said, you see the mountain out there, Ararat. This is a very important mountain for us. And you have so much territory. An apology would not be enough. What would really work is the symbol of Ararat. And if Ararat is in Armenian territory one day, maybe we can also accept the apology and try to forgive. And this coming from young Armenians to me was quite disappointing because it fuels basically the threat perception that Turkey has. Especially Americans in the audience may question what's the big deal with the genocide term? Why is Turkey so much determined to, to deny that it was a genocide and to, to, to basically uh, uh, why, why is Turkey spending so much money, so much political capital, so much effort to basically fight the uh, uh, efforts of uh, the US Congress, of uh, different foreign governments, foreign parliaments to recognize the genocide. Because there's a fear in Turkey. And I think we need to understand this fear. We need to understand the threat perception in Turkey. The threat perception, the fear in Turkey is fueled by the fact that recognition of the, what happened in 1915 as genocide would be just the first step. And that there would be, from the Armenian community uh, in the United States, in France, uh, across the world, uh, and in Armenia too, demands, financial compensation demands, territorial demands. And in that sense, this is why you have to understand that uh, the issue for Turkey is much more complicated than just accepting or coming to terms with what happened. It is essentially a, 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 an issue that goes to the heart of the territorial integrity of Turkey. And here I want to introduce a term that I think goes to the heart of the problem. Turkey, like Armenia, is a traumatized nation. We have to understand the trauma of Turkey. We know the trauma of Armenia. The trauma of Armenia is 1915. Armenia is traumatized and the identity of Armenia in many ways is based on this narrative of victimhood understandably, it's very clear. But the counterpart to this Armenian narrative of victimhood is the Turkish narrative of victimhood and the Turkish trauma. We are less familiar with the Turkish trauma. And I think what we will see in the next three years is uh, the Turkish government uh, trying to basically remind the world as we get closer to 2015, to the centenary of the tragedy of 1915, that there is actually a Turkish trauma, a Turkish narrative of victimhood as well. It was also the year of the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. It was the year of basically Turkey losing 
uh, most of it's the Ottoman Empire losing most of its territories. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people being uprooted uh, from uh, uh, Caucasus, the Balkans, uh, uh, and uh, many other parts of the empire. And there is this belief in Turkey that the West does not pay enough attention, does not really look at the Turkish dimension of basically what happened in, during the World War I. And in that sense, I think when uh, Foreign Minister Davutoglu refers to the need for just memory, a uh, justice in memory, he refers to the fact that, uh, yes, Armenians have suffered, but let's not forget that Turks also have suffered. Now, can this go, can this kind of narrative of Turkish victimhood and this Turkish uh, understanding that there has to be a just memory, can it go somewhere? Can it create basically empathy in the eyes of the world community for, for Turkey? I'm, I'm pessimistic about that. Many people will basically say, yes, fine, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of Muslim Turks were also killed, uprooted, ethnically cleaned. But, uh, this doesn't basically justify what happened to the Armenians. It doesn't justify 1915. It doesn't create mitigating, uh, uh, alleviating circumstances for the policy of deportations that turned into massacres. So uh, in a way, uh, I don't think that government initiatives targeting 2015 will go somewhere. It will only polarize uh, uh, the Armenian diaspora and uh, it will create uh, suspicion among uh, Arme the Armenian community, a suspicion that we are already seeing uh, in the writings of uh, uh, the Armenian uh, uh, intellectuals in the United States, basically who see in this Turkish effort of talking about just memory or in this Turkish efforts to create some outreach to Armenian diaspora members who are interested in dialogue with Turkey as a kind of divide and conquer tactic finding good Armenians who are basically open to dialogue with Turkey. So there may be some level of criticism that the civil society initiatives, such as the one we want to initiate, are somewhat tainted by what the Turkish government is trying to do, this outreach uh, emblem. I just want to say to you that uh, what is happening at many levels and what is definitely happening with Hasna is not something directed by the Turkish government, is not something that has an agenda of basically supporting what the Turkish government is trying to do. We're trying to create really momentum for uh, projects uh, that are uh, independent, that bring Turks and Armenians together, uh, that are long-term, and they may sound very idealistic, they may sound quite naive given the gloom and doom present in Turkish-Armenian relations today, but that's the only hope we have. And uh, even if there is a uh, governmental approach which says we need more dialogue and we need to basically explain the Turkish side of the story, uh, we should not basically see this at the expense of civil society activities that are independent and standing on their own. And to be honest, we are at a point in Turkey where uh, the Turkish government is dealing with a number of internal and foreign policy issues that sidelines the Armenia issue. Armenia is simply not a priority at this point for the Turkish government. Turkey is dealing with Syria. Turkey is dealing with Iran. Just this Saturday there will be the P5 plus one uh, nuclear uh, talks between Iran and uh, uh, the West in Istanbul. The week before that, you had the Friends of Syria uh, conference in Turkey, uh, and 77 countries attended that. Turkey is engaged in high-level diplomacy. It's a very activist foreign policy that, is that it is pursuing. And when you look at the agenda of the Turkish foreign policy, you see Iran, Syria, Iraq, Israel, uh, Cyprus, so many issues. And Armenia is unfortunately basically there is an issue on which the prime minister, the government, is not willing to spend a lot of political capital at this point. The hope was that after the elections of 2011, there would be some political capital spent on this issue and somehow the protocol process could be revitalized. Well, 
The bad news is that right now, the only political capital that remains in Turkey is being spent on the number one internal issue in Turkey, which is the Kurdish problem. The Kurdish question, with its domestic and international dimension, is a much more urgent problem than any kind of uh, agenda that may be linked to Armenia. Uh, but the irony here is that for Turkey to solve, to, call, uh, to find a kind of solution to the Kurdish problem, it needs to accept the identity dimension of the Kurdish problem. And dealing with the Kurdish problem would require a more multicultural Turkey, a Turkey that actually understands the identity dimension of the problem, that the Kurdish problem cannot be solved just with economic development or just with uh, uh, policies that are related to uh, uh, some uh, uh, basic cultural rights, that there are much more uh, important political identity dimensions to this Kurdish problem. And as Turkey moves away from an understanding that there are only Turks in Turkey and that we are all Turks and that this assimilation project of transforming everyone into a Turkish citizen uh, has failed and that we have to understand that there are minorities in Turkey, but that accepting the minorities would, should not automatically lead to separatism, should not automatically lead to an agenda where we push for secessionism, uh, that by, by basically accepting the multicultural nature of Turkey, by starting with the Kurdish question, but also dealing with the multicultural past, by coming to terms of the fact that Turkey inherited from the Ottoman Empire a multicultural entity, a multicultural ethnic landscape, I think this would also open a more mature, a more open debate about Armenia and about the Armenians and what happened to the two million Armenians that existed in Turkey and that are no longer there. That is the basic question. In that sense, uh, the only slightly optimistic thing that I would like to end with, since uh, I, I think I presented quite a gloomy picture in terms of what the Turkish uh, political landscape is, is that as Turkey deals with the Kurdish problem in a more democratic way, by opening more room for multiculturalism, there will be also, I think, unavoidably a debate about multiculturalism. And as there is a debate about multiculturalism, there will be a debate about what happened to these different cultures that are no longer there. And this may lead to a, an opportunity where Turkey discusses the Armenia question, the presence of Armenians in the past in Turkey, which are no longer there, with a context that is not related to the 24th of April, that is not related to what's happening in the US Congress, that is not related to what's happening in the French Parliament, that is not dictated by the West, but, but, it, but it is dictated by Turkey's own dynamics. It is Turkey's own political dynamics, not the West that should dictate uh, the, the discussion about uh, what happened to Armenians in Turkey. And in that sense, this is a debate that needs to happen in Turkey's own uh, domestic uh, uh, dynamics without really pressure from the West. The more pressure we get from the, from the West, uh, whenever there's the discussion about the uh, Armenian issue in Turkey, uh, uh, unfortunately is the time when you have a French parliament or the US Congress dealing with it and that enters the debate and the media is paying attention to this and of course this is not the best way of discussing uh, uh, Armenia. This is not the best, most conducive to constructive uh, analysis or dialogue of uh, what happened uh, uh, in 1915. To, to conclude, I think we need to understand that the protocols uh, are frozen. They're not going to be revitalized in the near future. Uh, the Turkish domestic and political foreign policy agenda is loaded, and there can't be much uh, at the governmental level that will happen in the short term. Uh, what needs to happen is a long-term commitment to uh, grassroots, people to people, cultural dialogue. This may sound very idealistic and naive, but I will end with a question. What is more realistic to expect that Turkey will uh, all of a sudden recognize in 2015 that there was a genocide and to apologize for it and to think about compensation and, uh, 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 and to basically uh, 
uh, forget all the policies that have been followed so far. Is this the realistic norm? Expecting basically this maximalist agenda to bear fruits that somehow if we push for Turkey to apologize, if we push for Turkey to uh, 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 compensate, is this the realism we're talking about? In my opinion, this is naive. Turkey will not really do these things in the short term. The only hope we have for Turkey to actually come to terms with what happened in its history is by investing in long-term uh, democratization of Turkey, in long-term people-to-people uh, -people, uh, dialogue, and in opening avenues for uh, Turks and Armenians to come together in any kind of platform, any kind of platform that brings Turks and Armenians together should be supported. And the less government involvement at this point, the better. Because when the governments are involved, there's always an agenda. There are always conspiracy theories and there are always uh, question marks. So uh, this is my plea for uh, more support, more uh, uh, interest uh, for uh, NGOs, civil society, and people-to-people -people dialogue. I'll be happy to end here, and uh, Edward and I can answer questions. I'll be very interested in also uh, Edward's own take on this, because this is a Turkish-Armenian platform, after all, as well. So uh, I don't want to monopolize all the answers. Thank you very much. We, we know nothing officially. Uh, I did a little study and found out that the uh, illegal trade across the borders, either directly from Armenia to Turkey or through Georgia, is approximately $145 million a year. Now that could be much, much larger. And, we should try to encourage that. But uh, under this project, or these projects that have been designed, they're much smaller and, uh, and they're trying to get people to people involved. But that's as much as I know. Sir. <clears throat> I, I blame Nevzar for the timing of this event. She, I had no idea that there would be basically a connection with a, uh, April. Uh, I understand your question, it's a legitimate question. But again, it shows in a way that your question, and I, I don't blame you for asking, uh, asking it, it shows that there is always suspicion uh, about what uh, NGOs are doing. Uh, we are not basically uh, a, 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 uh, a group of people uh, with an agenda. We don't try to 
get a sense of basically what would work, what, how the timing would work. Uh, the whole point that I was trying to make is that uh, when you talk about what happens in Washington, the agenda of Congress, uh, what, when you talk about Turkish foreign policy, when you talk about Turkey, uh, uh, Azerbaijan relations, uh, there's always room for basically suspicion in, in terms of who's doing what, uh, a zero-sum game, and why things are happening at a certain period. Conspiracy theories and threat perceptions are abundant. Uh, but we need to come to a point, I think, in, in people-to-people dialogue where uh, these kind of projects uh, will continue without paying much attention to what's happening between governments. Because if we basically uh, believe that uh, a, a polarization in Turkish-Armenian relations or the polarization in Turkish-American relations will somehow impact NGOs and civil society to civil society dialogue, I think we would be from the outset accepting that it is government driven, that governments determine the tone of what civil society is doing. The whole point of these initiatives is that they should happen, continue, despite the governments, despite the agenda, despite the narrative of the governments. And uh, in that sense, I can clearly state that this event has nothing to do with uh, uh, basically the agenda of Congress or U.S. domestic politics. We just happen to think that it would be a good opportunity to bring uh, the NGO dimension of Turkish-Armenian reconciliation uh, to the floor. More, more attention paid to this by the Turkish media, Armenian media, American media is, is important. And the fact that it is perceived uh, with an agenda, I guess, is unavoidable and is a byproduct of the times we're in, the polarized times that we're in. A very quick remark as not a journalist in this yeah. case, but as an Armenian. If I think it would be very constructive if we tried to be, in this case, very sensitive, because I think it may be pursued wrong for, for the other side. So it would be my suggestion to S9 and, and the distinguished panel to organize these events Anywhere outside of that. <laughs> yeah. Understood. I was wondering what, after hearing you, you know, what we should do, what we should not do. I was wondering what the Turkish government is doing to educate their people. Forget admitting, <coughs> using the word genocide. Forget that. And uh, this is the first time, as a matter of fact, I hear from a, a Turkish person talking this much. And this much I mean, I have not heard anything like this from a Turkish person before. It's encouraging. So my question again, what does the Turkish government do to educate their people instead of what most, most, most Armenians will say, instead of educating them the right way, they are brainwashing their people, especially the youth, which I think that kind of brainwashing can backfire. Uh, I, I need, I'll just... You can, we can hear you better, please. Uh, the Turkish education system is a product of the nation building process uh, that started in the 1920s and 30s, and it is essentially based on, uh, as you described, 
uh, in the form of nationalism to basically assimilate everyone into a Turkish identity. And the perception of the Ottoman Empire, the perception of what happened in World War I is not really uh, dealt with uh, in the Turkish education system. The Turkish education system is part of the problem in terms of creating what I call the trauma and the narrative of victimhood. Uh, in Armenia, as I said, you have a narrative of victimhood, which is also part of the Armenian education system. There can be improvement in the Armenian education system too, probably. But that's the problem that we're dealing with. The two governments... The there were millions and a half, there were millions and a half, and in the Turkish education system you learned that the victim was basically the whole empire that lost all the, all the Turks that have been uprooted from different parts of the empire. The narrative of victimhood is pretty much present, that you cannot trust the West. Turkey has a love and hate relationship with the West. It, on the one hand, it's the most radical westernization project, Kemalism, with secularism, nation building. It's a very radical cultural revolution based on westernization. On the other hand, it has a very suspicious outlook towards the West because it was Western imperialist powers that had dismantled the Ottoman Empire. And there is a sense that uh, Armenians were instigated to rebellion by Western powers, that they basically wanted to establish a state. To the degree that I'm familiar with, what we are learning in Turkey is when you di discuss these issues at the higher level maybe not elementary, middle school, but uh, towards the later stage of high school and university, you learn about basically uh, the nationalist fragmentation in Turkey, how uh, it started with the Greek nationalism, Serbian, Bulgarian, Albanian, Arab, and finally Armenians too wanted their own state and they rebelled and they wanted their own state. They were supported by Russians and Turkey basically uh, had to take action in the form of deportations. You, you get basically the official history. Now, this is the problem. How can you get away from the official history? How can you go to the roots of a more balanced, analytical version of what happened in 1915, how the situation unfolded? I don't think that you can expect much from national education systems or official history. Official history and national education system will be based on a, a very simplistic idea of good and bad. Uh, what we need to find out is whether we can find alternative narratives of what happened. And here, the Turkish media can play a big role. Turkish journalists, Turkish columnists, people who actually write books on these issues can come up with alternative, uh, non-official versions of uh, history. And these can be discussed as Turkey becomes more democratic. I'm sure that there will be attempts to change also the official narrative. But this is a long-term process. The real questions we should be asking is, how can Turkey get away from the official version of history towards a more balanced version of history? And my answer to that is only through actually uh, more democratization and more dialogue between intellectuals in, two, in the two countries who are willing to talk, who are willing to come up with an alternative narrative. Right now, what we have is the trauma the trauma of having lost an empire, the trauma of Armenia, and narratives of victimhood. We need to transcend the narrative of victimhood, and the only way we can transcend the narrative of victimhood is to change the threat perception. Turkey still has a threat perception. The fear that if you accept what happened in 1915, you will open a Pandora's box, and that it's not just about using the genocide term or <coughs> apologizing that somehow a big price will have to be paid and Turkey will have to basically uh, deal with this issue uh, by uh, uh, opening chapters of its history but also by accepting that uh, there will be consequences. The fear is that these consequences are, are, are unbearable for Turkey. And here I think Turks need to hear what is the Armenian agenda when they hear from the Armenian diaspora, from Armenian organizations that, of course, an apology or acknowledgement of genocide would not suffice, that there should be consequences for what happened, this fuels the Turkish threat perception. This is why I wanted to tell you my own personal experience in Armenia when I was 
they are talking about 1915 genocide. I gave talks similar to the talk that I gave now in Armenian universities, think tanks. And the reaction I got from Armenian youth was that they were actually angry with Turkey. An apology to them is just the beginning. It's not that meaningful if it doesn't come with compensation, if it doesn't come with the symbols like Mount Ararat. And that creates trauma in Turkey. That fuels the Turkish nationalist perception that uh, Armenia has territorial demands, that we, we are naive, that Turkish intellectuals such as myself, people who apologize with the apologizing campaign, or people who, uh, called, uh, who walk at Hranting's funeral with uh, slogans, we are all Armenians, are just naive. They don't understand the real demands coming from Armenia. And that's, that's the trauma, that's the narrative of victimhood I'm talking about. I very much appreciate what you're saying. And I'm going to, to ask you to elaborate a little bit more to help me and others to understand. And I'm going to use an example that may be a little bit extreme, but I think there's some similarities and it would help us all to um, expand our, our, our viewpoints and our understanding. And I hear when you say that the tragedy of the fall of the Ottoman Empire is something that traumatized um, and I use it as um, an analogy that may as I say a little bit extreme. But what if nobody acknowledged the Holocaust in Germany? And what if the fall of the German Empire was considered a tragedy and the victims of the Holocaust were not acknowledged? Mm -hmm. How would civil society create a dialogue that would enable that to move forward? And as I say, I know that's a little bit extreme. But in you know, the realm of our current situation and people trying to reach across the aisle, sometimes we have to look at that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm I would just appreciate if you could sure. make an analogy that maybe we try to sure. in that direction. I think you go to the heart of the matter as far as uh, Turkey's uh, perception of the problem is concerned. If there is any parallel, and I know you didn't uh, establish the parallel, you mentioned it, that it's extreme, but it's unavoidable that uh, there is in the eyes of uh, Western intellectuals this perception that what happened in 1915, uh, which is basically overwhelmingly accepted as genocide, is the first genocide of the 20th century. And that uh, this set a precedent and somehow there are unavoidable comparisons with uh, the Holocaust and what happened to the Armenians. This is exactly the trauma and the threat perception that I'm talking about as far as Turkey is concerned. Turkey is doing its best to prove that 1915 is not comparable to the Holocaust, that 1915 uh, does not have the same final solution, the same systemic annihilation of the Armenian people, the same parallel uh, and symmetry of anti-Semitism in uh, Western Europe or Central Europe. Turkey is trying to prove that Turks and Armenians that, uh, and that the Armenians in the Ottoman community, uh, Ottoman Empire, were actually part of the social fabric of society, that Armenians in fact were very much present in the, in the Ottoman Foreign Service, that there was no sense of anti-Armenian feelings comparable to anti-Semitism in Germany. So any attempt to call 1915 as genocide is perceived by the Turkish officialdom as an attempt to establish a parallel between the Holocaust, what happened to the Jews, and the Armenians. And this is simply not acceptable for the Turkish government. This is why Turkish, the Turkish government is often saying, uh, let history be discussed by historians, leave history to historians. The politicians should not get involved because there's a strong belief that if historians come together, they will be sophisticated enough to distinguish 1915 from the Holocaust. Now, you, went, you, you, you basically asked the question of what would happen if 
there was a denial of the Holocaust. Well, the same logic was the French Parliament's logic, the idea that there should not be a denial of genocide, that what happened in 1915 is genocide, and denying the Holocaust is the same thing as denying 1915, and it should be punishable. Well, the Turkish viewpoint is that it starts with the per perception that what happened the, the, in 1940, uh, 1939 to 45 is not comparable to anything else. That the Holocaust is an event that uh, has no parallel in human history. And uh, in that sense, uh, the minute uh, uh, we make comparisons between the Holocaust and the genocide, uh, and 1915, I think we go to the heart of Turkey's threat perception, the fear that somehow this will open the Pandora's box in terms of the compensations I was talking about, that just like there was compensations from Germany towards uh, uh, Jews who lost their lives, there would have to be compensations by the Turkish government. Uh, and that uh, if you establish a parallel between uh, Germany in 1939 and Ottoman Empire 1915, we basically start from the wrong, uh, wrong page. And uh, this is a big dilemma because uh, we, we need to find a, a way for the Turkish officialdom to come to terms with 1915 without the fear that this is comparable to the Holocaust, that it will have to be also, that, uh, it will have to come with compensation demands and, and eventually territorial demands. I know this is not the question you asked, but it fuels the perception of the Turkish government. And the perception of the Turkish government that is that the Armenian diaspora is pushing for basically exactly the parallel between the Holocaust and 1915. And that Turkey will, in that sense, will be even more victimized. It will be even more traumatized. The narrative of victimhood of Turkey will be even stronger. And uh, this is why I think uh, we have to be very careful in establishing historic parallels uh, between, uh, uh, 19, uh, between the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide of 1915. Well, how, civil could you, how could you make a parallel between what, how could the Holocaust have been dialogued through civil society dialogue and the way that you're looking for that the question of the Armenian genocide becoming a dialogue? You, you start with people who are willing to accept that 1915 was a genocide to begin with, without the argument that basically this is uh, uh, comparable to the Holocaust. You, have, you start with people who basically are willing to accept that the Ottoman Empire was not the Third Reich. You start with people who basically are willing to engage in a dialogue about what happened in 1915 without any kind of governmental agenda involved. This is why the protocols, in a way, uh, was an interesting experiment because there was a historical commission dimension to the protocols. How would you bring historical commission people to the table uh, when there is not even a agreement about what happened in 1915? The Armenian side would basically say there's no question that this was a genocide and Turkish side would come to the table saying let's question what happened in 1915. Let's question whether it was genocide or not. Let's try to understand the dimension of this uh, in, from the Ottoman perspective. And here you would immediately get this clash of basically government appointed historians dealing with the official agenda. The key is to find in civil society people who are willing to take a distance from the officialdom and who are willing to say what happened in 1915 was genocide. If Turkey calls what happened in the Balkans, in Srebrenica, in 1996, uh, when, when did it happen? 94, Srebrenica genocide, where 8,000 Muslims were killed. Just what happened in Adana in 1896, in 94 uh, itself is genocide. In one day, there were more people killed. Uh, if Turkey is willing to call what happened to the Uyghurs uh, in Western China a genocide, of course what happened to Armenians in 1915 is genocide. You have to find people who are willing to accept that this was a genocide, but then the key is not to establish a maximalist parallel with the Holocaust. Uh, you, uh, please believe me when I say I don't sympathize with you this evening trying to defend the indefendable and to explain the unexplainable. But you, 
I just spent half an hour explaining why. Uh, the, the fear is in Turkey that it will not end with accepting genocide. The threat perception, let me finish. Look, let me interrupt you. Can I, I listen no, no, to you? Let me interrupt you to say something. My father's entire family was killed by the Turks. Well, the narrative of victimhood is exactly what I'm talking no, about. Hold it, please. If you say to me, Mr. Tavurkian, we admit that we killed your father's entire, the Ottoman Turks killed your father's entire family. I don't want a thing of compensation. I'm not going to go live in Chumkush. I don't want a penny. I just want you to say, yes, they killed your family. Now we're getting somewhere. This is, this is what Turkey needs to hear. This is, I think, a much more productive way of discussing this because the fear in Turkey is that you may be in the minority, that there will be people who will actually say, wait a minute, the lands, the money, ter territory, and you, you may have, you're, you're one individual, but when you look at organizations, when you look at the narrative, you have, you have to understand the Turkish perception that it will not end with just recognizing this, that this is the Pandora's box. You have a narrative, basically, of victimhood. Turks have their own narrative of victimhood. They would immediately start saying, what about all the Turks have, that have lost their territories in the Caucasus, in Bulgaria, in, uh, in the Balkans? What about them? Why is the world not paying attention to the Turkish genocide that happened in these lands? That's internal. That's well, a Turkish error. Not a again, that, that, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but we need to find a way to discuss this. And if you, as an individual, are willing to voice the fact that all you're demanding from Turkey is an acknowledgement, an apology, empathy. I think we may be getting somewhere because I think as Turkey becomes a more mature democracy, as it is coming to terms with the Kurdish problem, as it is coming to terms with the decline of the Ottoman Empire, it will come to terms with what happened. But the fear is that it will not just end with accepting and apologizing for it, that there will be more maximalist, more hardline demands and that this is not acceptable. This is why Turkey is spending so much money on lobbying firms. This is why Turkey is constantly feeling that it is under siege from the international community. Thank you. 
with each other, they learn about each other, um, that's a very good thing. Is it your hope that those people would start talking about the difficult issues? Do you um, make ways for them to start talking about reconciliation? And I, I see you looking puzzled. And the reason that I'm saying that is because um, I'm not a reconciliation expert, but I know that there are processes that yeah. are established. So there's a recognition of the truth, <coughs> there is an apology, and sometimes there are reparations. And I want to also say that um, I work with Native American people, and um, the U.S. government making reparations, land claims, and, and um, financial compensation, it's a good thing. So how could a dialogue between people who are making friends with each other um, then move on to a conversation about, you know, what is a constructive reconciliation process? I mean, I, I understand your question. I, I think it's a uh, very important point, and I, I, I know that we'll have to probably leave at 8.30. So let me wrap up okay. with uh, uh, my answer to your question. Look, there, there can be two different strategies. I could have spent my half an hour talking about the importance of uh, socioeconomic issues, grassroots organizations, people's to people, people to people dialogue. But my fear is that when we start a discussion about Turkish-Armenian reconciliation with technical issues such as uh, socioeconomic cooperation, uh, micro, micro, uh, uh, micro projects, uh, microfinance projects, uh, agricultural projects, uh, entrepreneurialism. That's perfectly fine. But there's an 800 pound gorilla in the room. And we can find ways to skirt the problem and say, let's not talk about this 800 pound gorilla in the room because there's no way we will agree on the shape of the gorilla. But to me, we came to a point where it is unavoidable to talk about the big issue. This is why I wanted to talk about 1915. There's no way to, to basically go around it. Everyone talks about it, everyone that here is Turkish Armenian reconciliation thinks about, okay, how do we go beyond 1915? And I still believe that if we solely focus on 1915, we will get nowhere. We have to find ways of strengthening the uh, non-genocide related issues, uh, the dialogue, the cultural dialogue, the economic dialogue, the grassroots dialogue. And my hope is that only through working on these projects, there will be room, there can be room for addressing 1915 in a less poisonous way. Uh, to start with 1915 may not be a good idea, but to talk about it, to, to basically clean the air that there, there is something out there, that we should be paying attention to it and that uh, Turkey as the bigger country, and this is the most important point I want to end with, Turkey as the bigger country, as the more successful country, as the country that is on the rise, as the country that has become the 17th largest economy, an 80 million country, a country that has full of confidence today, that basically become uh, a, 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 a regional superpower, should find some level of confidence, some level of maturity in itself to say, if we talk about 1915 and if we tell our Armenian brothers, our Armenian friends on the 24th of April, this coming 24th of April, we share your pain. We regret what happened in 1915. We may not be ready to call it what you want us to call it, but you should know that we regret what happened. We are sorry for what happened. We may disagree on the name of what happened. We call it massacre, we call it tragedy. But you should know that we share your pain on this painful day. Instead of waiting the message coming from the White House, instead of waiting what the French Parliament would say, instead of waiting what the 
uh, uh, West would say on the 24th of April, if Turkish president, if the Turkish prime minister, the Turkish foreign minister can issue a statement of empathy, we would be getting somewhere. And that, that day will only come if we have more Turks and Armenians putting pressure on their governments to say that. If we have more journalists, more education people, more, 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 more intellectuals, more entrepreneurs who will say we need that kind of empathy. I know this sounds idealistic, naive, but as I said, to expect Turkey to uh, apologize and to basically pay compensation and to have this maximalist narrative of uh, suspicion about Turkey, that's not realistic. That's in fact naive. Turkey will not do these things unless we pay more attention to people-to-people -people dialogue. So I want to end on this maybe uh, hopelessly optimistic note.